Mark Galeoni, who is going to be joining as the Director of Building and Materials Sciences at Elliston. Mark works on accelerating the adoption of emerging construction technologies at Elliston with mass timber as its primary focus. The topic of his presentation will today be about mass timber today and tomorrow from a contractor's perspective. We're very excited to have you with us, Mark. Thank you. Good to see a lot of friendly faces in the audience. I'll, I'll jump right into it. Um, so my, starting with an introduction of who I am. Oh man, that's way too big. <laughs> I didn't know the screen set up when I made this whole deck. So. But the, the next slide's even more embarrassing. <laughs> um, but my name is Mark. I work at Ellis Don. Um, you know, I, I've been enjoying building things since I was quite young. Um, this is me like a, in elementary school. One of my crowning achievements in life, actually, was building this uh, snow fort. Um, I'll just dwell on this for a while because this is funny. But uh, two funny things about this. A, we collected all the neighbors' snow and put it on our lawn and piled up so high that my parents actually couldn't see it of their front window for about a week and a half, which they weren't too th thrilled about, but they got over it when it melted. And then when all the snow left, the, uh, you know, when it melted in the spring, my dad's lawn actually entirely died because uh, we, we kind of removed all the insulation and froze and it all died. So uh, he had a full, a full hard reset on his lawn, which was, uh, again, another crowning achievement and a, a family story we tell to this day. So anyways, I've been building things for a while, starting with that snow fort. I now have, have the privilege of working on uh, you know, things that are a little bit larger in scale. I work for a big company named Balistan, we're a contractor. We kind of have done work all over the world, primarily in Canada these days. This is the only propaganda slide in the deck, I promise. Um, so I work on an interesting team called Construction Sciences, which is kind of like a a small R&D team in construction. So, you know, we have the advantage of working within this big contractor, but in this small team, construction science is where we get to do a lot of interesting, cool stuff, some of which I'll show you today. We, you know, outside of the stuff I'll show you today, we have like concrete experts, glass and glazing experts, steel experts. So I've been doing this for about 10 years and um, was the timber guy for a big chunk of that and now kind of lead the whole team. Um, so it's pretty interesting, pretty exciting. And um, what we're going to be talking about today is kind of the timber component of that. And so I usually, when I do presentations like this, kind of go through a lot of the basics. We don't have a lot of time today, so I crossed out a number of them. I should kind of figure out where to, where to point this. Yeah, there we go. I crossed out a number of them. I actually don't know if I'll have time even to go through the, the remainder. So I might skip over a couple and fly through, because what I want to leave time for is to elaborate on what... Uh, I think Craig Applegath uh, touched on this morning, which was the hybrid timber panels. So my role is kind of twofold. We support the operations of this big construction company. There's 150, 200 sites on the go at any given moment, not all of which are timber, most of which are not. Um, and then at the same time, we try to use our position in the industry to like advance the industry. So the hybrid timber panels is one of those projects, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that uh, we won't even get into today. but. Happy to chat about if we have time. So, you know, timber is not a big uh, new thing for Elistan at all. It's been going for several decades. You've kind of seen a lot of these types of structures around the country. Um, they're all curvy. They're all kind of boutique. That's really been the domain that we've worked in up until uh, about four years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of Canada's contractors' experiences kind of mirror that. We've done a lot of these kind of atrium spaces, pool roofs. All of that stuff continues today. But the exciting thing and the newer thing that we're going to be talking about is more uh, on the large scale, ubiquitous um, kind of buildings that would not have been timbered uh, just a short few years ago. So, you know, we still do a lot of these boutique things at community centers in Vancouver. Uh, we built the Canadian Expo Pavilion in Dubai um, a couple a couple years ago with Canadian wood. That was a whole thing. Um, but this is more of the big scale. This is kind of... Uh, what we're, what we're here to talk about today. And we want to, I just want to go through a couple um, different topics and just share some, you know, in, in pieces of perspective from the contractor side. So this is Centennial College here. We'll come back to this job uh, quite frequently here. Um, uh, we, we heard a bunch about T, uh, Alex's job, T3 Sterling here. So I'll give you a little bit of, of a scoop on some of the things we learned during construction there. 
Um, and so this is just a, a snapshot of what we've, you know, this is all in the last probably year and a half to two years. We've erected maybe half a million or more uh, square feet of timber in Toronto alone. Um, and a whole bunch of other jobs at West, but I'll focus on some of the Toronto jobs just out of interest for the audience. Uh, this is Humber College, an interesting hybrid structure um, where the first four stories are like um, a, a music, uh, it, it's a music faculty and music teaching spaces. So they, they, they elected to do that at a cast of place concrete. There's a lot of theaters, huge long spans, very high acoustic requirements. And then on top of that sits another four stories which is a student residence. So this is a interesting situation where there was a full hybrid. So that was the initial rendering. It's actually now topped off and built. This is like a couple of weeks into timber erection. Um, so those are the three big jobs, all kind of in half hour of, of, of here. And we, um, we've learned a bit over the, over the years and I'll, I'll jump into some of that now. So starting with some of the supply chain, you know, this is, we, we think this is part of the contractor's role to really dive into the supply chain, um, you know, domestically and abroad and really try to understand what is out there. It's difficult for, you know, a client or, uh, or an institution to, on a project by project basis, get fully up to speed on what's happening in the industry. And so we try to keep a constant tabs on who's in the mass timber landscape. This is actually out of date. This goes out of date every day. But, um, you, know, it's, um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, you, you actually can learn, you can learn a lot by going to everyone's website, but you actually can't learn a lot of insight onto like what their actual business model is by just kind of uh, generating things from the internet. So we actually try to get out to everyone's plants, uh, understand their business model. And what we do is we try to map their businesses against um, kind of the whole supply chain. So like this is just kind of a, 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 an abstract uh, representation of like if you were to control the entire supply chain of mass timber, from kind of the forest down to the uh, installation on site, you would kind of have all of these different um, honeycombs checked. And so you could imagine like a really vertically integrated company maybe does all of these. Um, and so when we go around the country and around the world and we visit all these places and we try to dig in, ask questions, of prod a little bit about their business models, uh, we kind of map it against what of this do they actually internalize what do they subcontract what are they willing to take on what are they not i um, mean it's really interesting so you know a vertically integrated company would look something like this you know no one's like making their own adhesives um so that's usually externalized same with a lot of hardware but you know there's companies that have raw materials sourcing in-house um in supply install engineering in-house um you know some others this is a much more common business model where um, you know, around the world where not everyone has like the primary harvesting internalized. Um, and then even further, uh, a common business model is uh, what we sometimes refer to as like a more of a value added manufacturer where they have like a very strong, they're like an integrator role. They have very strong, like maybe an engineer or project management type of service in house. And they accomplish everything else on this list through partnerships, through buying. Um, and so there's no, there's, there certainly are pros and cons to each of these business models, but it's not necessarily um, transparent or, I mean, they, they tell you about it, obviously, but it, it's not necessarily obvious on the surface when you're kind of like going to people's websites or trying to contract with people. But, you know, when you're going through things like COVID or you're going through different types of uh, schedule demands, it's very important to understand what is actually uh, uh, within the control of a, a subcontractor and what kind of risk they're taking on themselves, um, because that certainly exposes us as a contractor. So really interesting pros and cons to all of it. It's just uh, good to know that not every contractor uh, or supplier is uh, created equally. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we try to buy our mass timber. We do a lot of buying a mass timber. We try to buy it um, similar to how we would buy like a complicated curtain wall system or a complicated structural steel building. And a lot of that is through design assist. Um, so we procure through design assist. Um, you know, not only does that allow you to kind of get in early and secure production slots, but it also allows you to uh, kind of tailor your design to optimize for those individual capabilities on those honeycombs. In addition to there being like crazy variation in business model, there's also a lot of uh, interesting variation in the capabilities dimensionally and species access, things like that. So, you know, a lot of good uh, um, work can be done on the upfront if you uh, kind of engage appropriately. 
Um, so we've had different experiences there. Uh, moving on to m and &E integration, uh, mechanical and intellectual integration. You know, you can do this how you do every other building. There's kind of two streams. You do the raised access floor and put a, a, a portion of the services under, under the floor and you still have electrical, you still have sprinklers on the ceiling or you can kind of do a lot of surface mounting on the ceilings. Uh, we've, the buildings that we've been working on uh, have almost entirely trended to the, to the right here where the, the style has been to kind of expose on the ceiling. And so I'll show you some of the experience. This is not our building. This is the, one of the Heinz jobs that was built before we started building. But, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that uh, you start noticing when you walk through these completed timber buildings um, where the structure starts being impacted uh, at a very early stage by things like mechanical requirements. So what we're looking at here is, you know, just some, some services running along a, a, an elevator core. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of interesting structural details that I'll walk through here, one of which is a, like an upturned beam. So you can see that in the main field of the office, you have a, a beam that's maybe half a meter deep. And then you have this upturned beam right at the core. So you do two things here. They've shortened the span. Uh, and so the beam can be shallower just because it's a shorter span. But also, you know, if we could see through the wood, it's actually the beam is thrust up into the thickness of the DLT or in this case, NLT. And uh, so doing those two things in combination bought them a ton of headroom. And it allows you to kind of run your services straight instead of doing these kind of jogs along the ceiling, which you may have to do had you not done an upturned beam. Um, that's one popular strategy. Um, this is another strategy we've used in our Centennial College project called a Gerber, a Gerber system. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a fancier approach, not necessarily more efficient, but it's an interesting structural option where, um, you know, depending on the geometry you're building and how many bays you kind of have on either side of the core, we did a, a, a single beam cantilever out over top of, partial over top of the um, hallway. And so we, were, we allowed like a three foot just clear we're taking advantage here of uh, two-way structural capacity of CLT. So you couldn't pull this off with all panel products. You couldn't pull this off with NLT, or, as an example, as easily um, or as, as big of a gap. But, you know, CLT allowed us to do that. We took advantage of it. And it allowed us, you know, you can kind of see what the end result was here. We packed the um, fresh air distribution up into that space tight. And, um, you know, it allowed tons of headroom down below. These are things that you can't decide like when you're halfway through design. These are like very early conceptual discussions that, um, you know, again, design assist uh, favors. So uh, just some more things, um, you know, there's a lot of penetrations. When you get into the residential buildings, there's quite a few penetrations. Some of the challenges that we had is our residential trades aren't always used to doing like um, a full BIM design uh, to say the least, to be honest. Uh, but because we need the precise location of all the services in order to bake that into the, um, you know, the fabrication set uh, of the timber, not only did they have to, uh, we had to do the early coordination, but we also had to do it maybe about eight to 10 months earlier than they would have otherwise had to do that coordination. So it's not like they're doing extra work. Uh, we're not, we're not kind of forcing extra work on trades. The pipe locations, the rise locations always have to be coordinated. Usually comes out, like the morning of we're doing sleeving drawings in the morning of the pour where we're throwing them in, screwing them down. It's quite delayed in some cases here. It has to be done again, eight months in advance of what they, when they would have otherwise done it, not extra work, it's earlier work and earlier coordination and, and a little bit more difficult to make changes. So this is like a drone shot of that Humber college residence had 300 bathrooms. So you can imagine the amount of penetrations. If you zoom in, you can kind of see what, the end result was there. It's just like, yeah, it's just a mess of <laughs> penetrations, but like the building's built now, all the bathrooms are in um, and the coordination was like bang on, um, which is, you know, there's a couple of abandoned holes, things we had to patch here and there, um, but that early work, early coordination effort, it's honestly been a friction point on all the jobs we've done. It, and as soon as we can kind of get over top of the, um, you know, the, the friction of having to do work earlier than expected. Um, we get the coordination together and it's, it, it turned out to be a success. It just sometimes setting the expectations early matters. Just another shot of the underside of some of these jobs. Um, and I alluded to the fact, you know, we, we, we do quite a bit of 3D coordination. So this is a part of that Gerber system 
once it's packed in. This is an institutional building with like lab spaces and things. So it was very heavy on the mechanical front. Um, there's a drop ceiling that eventually goes in there. So, I mean, integration, uh, can't stress enough how early to start this step um, and how early to start that coordination. Just conceptually, how are you gonna route the, the primary services of the building? Um, you know, one of the interesting, <laughs> actually, I don't have time to chat about it too much. I'll keep, I'll keep moving. So cost is big, big topic. Everyone loves talking about cost. You know, we, we had a couple uh, good comments here from the panel earlier about, you know, sometimes you do pay a premium on the structure, but you find different ways to uh, rationalize that on the overall project. You know, our experience mirrors that. And, you know, it's, it's really not, in, in our experience, it's really not a case of like, you know, you, you swap in one number for another number. It's very much like a, um, you go through every line of the estimate and there's probably, there, there, there's like a, a swing one way or the other. Some items get cheaper, some items get a bit more expensive. And the thing you want to tease out of every single trade is people trying to price in unknowns, people trying to price in um, the, the, the risk they see because they haven't done it before. This will fade away in the industry as there's, this becomes more um, like widespread. However, we do still come across that on occasion, although, in, and especially in realms that seem a little bit different than timber, like mechanical and electrical. You know, one, just going back to like a photo like this, you know, the initial take of our electrician uh, was that this was gonna be a ton more work because you have to think about what changed for them. This is a concrete building and it went to timber. In a concrete building, they run all of their conduits through the slabs in plastic pipes. In the timber building, they're on a lift in the corridor, screwing all of the conduits onto the underside. It's a big change. It's arguably a lot harder to go on a lift and screw like this, this hallway had a 25 or 30 separate runs through it. So, you know, uh, however, there's a lot of, uh, if in a concrete building, all of the uh, services that get mounted after the fact are drilled into concrete and then threaded rod. In a timber building, it's an easy wood screw. So there's these trade-offs and I'm not joking when I say like a lot, uh, a, a big part of the estimate, you know, several divisions have these like quite nuanced, um, uh, differences that will matter project to project quite a bit. Um, and so what we've developed, like basically for each of these divisions, there's four or five divisions on the screen, basically like a detailed, like well, one page or like electrician, here's what you can actually expect the differences to be. You don't have to guess at it. This is it. Um, to try to get ahead of that uh, pricing in the unknown. So anyways, there's some pluses and minuses. It really depends on the job. We, we're seeing our buildings approach cost neutrality over time, like cost neutral to concrete. Um, you know, we still do see uh, premiums, like single, but yeah, I've been doing this now for uh, uh, just over six years. At the, the first price comparisons I did to concrete were like 25% premium. And then three years ago, it was like a 12% premium. Now we're down to single digit premiums uh, quite regularly. So like the trend lines are pretty clear here, you know, it's very market specific, but you know, it's clear that we're approaching uh, cost neutrality. Um, and, you know, there's when you uh, we always get asked, like when you go into bigger buildings, buildings that are taller, that step outside into the alternative solution territory that Alex was talking about. What does that cost? Does that add cost to my job? And it's interesting. It's actually not not as daunting as you may think when you say, like, oh, we're going outside the building code. You may have some some extra fees for your fire engineer, your code consultant. Uh, you have to pay for an alternative solution, which is uh, pretty manageable. Um, and so then this is kind of like a laundry list of stuff that may or may not be included. Um, you don't need all these at all, but uh, you know, this is kind of the laundry list of things that you might want to like throw in to increase the redundancy of your, this is like in collaboration with your code consultant, you go through all this uh, side by side. Um, so two fire pumps, two water pumps, high density sprinkler coverage, hazard level classifications. These are all things we've done on a variety of jobs when we're stepping outside of the, uh, the baked in uh, code solutions. Um, you know, if you added up the cost of all these, it's like, it's actually not that significant. Uh, these are the hard cost of this is like, you know, single 1%, maybe of a job less probably. Um, you know, insurance is an interesting one. This is an evolving conversation that's very dependent on the price of insurance, very dependent on the job itself, specifically the size of the job itself. If you have a smaller job, you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 million, you can attract 
a pretty good insurance carrier. Um, in our experiences, at least it changes certainly for others, but in our experiences, if you have a smaller job and you can convince uh, one broker or one carrier to insure you, um, you can have some success gaining uh, reasonable rates. And I say reasonable, I mean like, um, you know, maybe a bit more than concrete. Um, a lot of our jobs, and this is where my my perspective on the industry sometimes gets skewed. Elliston tends to look at like the top and in terms of scale in the industry, 100 million, 150 million, 200 million dollar jobs. And we have an insurance brokerage in house, and we're uh, we're struggling to find uh, single carriers that can carry uh, 200 million dollars of a mass timber project. And so, what we've ended up with um, on a lot of these jobs that we're showing is a uh, what we're called uh, subscription policies where we, our broker goes out and we have to subscribe a number of different carriers onto a subscription policy. We tend to do the negotiations with our broker. And um, the problem with going to multiple broke, uh, multiple carriers is they have to agree on terms. And so it eliminates some of the competitive bidding you end up with a worse uh, rate. Um, if there's, um, our, that's our experience at least. This is again, a trend line that's going in the right direction, I'd say. Um, you know, it, it was a significant times 10, five years ago, we've, we've got it down quite a bit there, but uh, we're still seeing premiums that, uh, uh, that's just part of our expectation. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'm going to skip over because I think I'm running low on time. Um, I'm actually going to jump through the entire schedule piece too, because I want to make sure I talk about moisture management because I, the sexy topic that is. And then um, I'll talk about the hybrid panel to close up. So yeah, moisture management, I, I skipped to this because um, um, it's a, there's a lot of information out there on moisture management. And uh, we see a lot of information from like um, envelope consultants or from suppliers themselves, but we wanted to give like the contractor's perspective on this. And so our real two goals are, you know, we want to, there's a lot of aesthetic timber in these buildings. We want to, eliminate as much as possible staining, aesthetic staining. And then we want to mitigate the risk of schedule delays due to having to dry stuff out. You know, the timber can get wet. This is when you zoom out at the, the timber building, you know, we're, we're starting manufacturing 10, 11, 15% moisture content. It comes to site then. During construction, you might get rained on, you might get snowed on. Uh, the, ele the moisture content, the wood elevates to a higher level. And our whole job is to, to kind of keep uh, uh, a maximum on that peak. You don't want this peak to go into the 30s and the 40% moisture contents. That's like the, the world where you have to start worrying about other things except staining and schedule. You know, if you get really, really wet, you have to start worrying about things like decay and, and in the long term, you have to really try hard to do a bad job to, get, to have any of those worries though. It really, the, the primary concerns are staining and schedule. You know, we did run into some interesting situations with um, strikes, labor strikes, people leaving site, stuff just halting for months that kind of uh, changed our, our mindset a little bit. But in, in normal times, you know, this is really the, the job is keep the, keep, the, uh, keep the peak down below 20 if you can. Um, or if you go above 20, make sure you have a way to get down below before you really cover it up. And then in service, it, it dries out again. So we didn't know anything about this five years ago. So the first thing we did was bought a bunch of wood and just bought every membrane from everybody. Bought a bunch of coatings, bought a bunch of tapes, and just set it up on one of our sites and just let it get rained on for like a bunch of seasons and installed a ton of moisture probes. We didn't know how wood wet. We didn't know how it dried out um, or really what to do about it. Um, and so we did a bunch of field research before we did any big scale jobs. And it comes down to a couple of things, reduce exposure. We put this photo in here of like someone erecting a massive tent over job because it's kind of funny, but like this is just not palatable at all in the North American market. Um, but there's other ways to reduce exposure that uh, actually maybe are more effective and like you can still use a crane at the same time. Uh, protection and drying and fixing. We'll talk a little bit through that. So, you know, reducing exposure doesn't mean you can't let the wood get rained on. In our experience, it means like don't let it sit in puddles for uh, for days on end. So we, we do an a lot of active water management. We do squeegeeing stuff off. Um, you know, we try to enclose things um, in sequence as we go. 
there's a lot of funny areas of buildings that tend to just stay open for a long time. And you don't want to forget about those, like the crane opening through a building. There's some very low tech. This is like I'm talking about putting a piece of plywood with tape on it. Um, is a way to prevent a lot of staining in our experience. Um, the hoist bays of buildings is another like kind of scar that gets left behind that, uh, you know, pretty easy to protect if you think about it. Um, and then, you know, this is on the, uh, what we generally recommend, you know, this is not a, necessarily a cheap solution, but really good bang for your buck is when you get to the roof to buy a pre-applied membrane on, you know, even just the roof. On one job, we did it all the floors. Maybe it was a bit overkill. But even if you just, if you bought a pre-applied factory applied membrane for just the roof, you don't have to worry about the days you're installing. You don't have to worry if your roofer is coming next week. You can, you, you can just let your site happen. Um, you know, for a, a buck or two a square foot, you can um, eliminate the schedule risk that you might have to dry out a roof, which is, you know, a bit of a real thing um, in different climates in Canada. So, you know, I'm not saying this is a solution for every job. I'm just saying we really have to look at our schedule. And if we're, if we're building in the middle of the winter or middle of the spring or middle of the summer, it's going to change the approach we actually take here. Um, there's all kinds of little details that uh, end up mattering, you know, before. There's, a, there's two times the building really gets wet. There's when you pull, um, when it rains on it, when it snows on it, like when it weathers outside is the, usually the first instance, instance. Then the second time, which you actually have to think about quite a bit, is when you go and pour, if your job has a concrete topping on it, you're basically just pouring liquid all over your building. Um, and that's when staining can actually become quite problematic. If you don't like think about details like little things like this we tape the columns um, and uh, uh, separation things of that nature so those those two times are really the ones we're managing for there's the hoist bear talking about um, but we're not perfect and we're going to be open with everyone that it's going to not be perfect there may be a time when we end up having to uh, um, you know to dry things out we ran into a situation on on this site where uh, our plywood splines got uh, really, really wet. Um, and, you know, if those of you have seen wet plywood, it kind of turns into a mush. And the, the idea of the plywood is to be the, uh, the diaphragm of the building. And so it can't be mush. Um, so uh, two options, we could rip, rip them out and replace them all, which we did in some areas. Or we, um, you know, you could dry them out, which it doesn't, is not a quick uh, proposition. It takes days. Uh, if not weeks, depending on the season you're in. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways around that. Again, through early design, we've, we've strayed away from plywood splines now going forward, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, not just for water. There's a, there's a couple of good reasons. Um, but also, you know, even if you have a great strategy, we write it all down up front, we execute it well, there's going to be a localized areas that need cleaning and fixing. And um, we've developed kind of a laundry list of chemicals ranging from like soap and water up into some like uh, some some good acids that like will really take pretty much anything off. And then the, the last resort, you just sand it off. But sanding is like a bit of a contagious thing. So you do one area, you kind of have to keep going until it looks nice, which is not the end of the world. So that's kind of today. We've been doing this for a number of years, a bunch of big jobs. Um, I'll maybe take five minutes and talk about some of the stuff tomorrow, like our hybrid, some of the things we're working on. Um, and I know Craig Applegath was up here earlier and he talked a bit about this hybrid panel. And so maybe, you know, in addition to going through a bit of the details, I'll try to elaborate on maybe some of the stuff he didn't cover. I'll also just kind of, uh, use this as a case study for like, you know, doing research in construction and how, uh, that can be difficult and why a lot of companies maybe don't do research in construction as well. There's just, there's a lot of obstacles uh, to doing so, which we, I'm happy to talk about. Craig definitely mentioned this, but we, uh, we, we set out with Dialogue 50-50 to see as a thought experiment and like a white paper exercise, can we push the span of a panel to 40 feet? We build a lot of tall office buildings. They all have 40 foot spans. We wanted to like have a timber option at our disposal, again, as a white paper, um, you know, like a few years ago. And so the idea would be like, yeah, we'd make a crazy panel. It would span from the core to the perimeter, 40 feet. Um, spitballing around for a little while. This is where we kind of arrived as a it's, a, it's a, it's a big hybrid of stuff that already exists. We just mash it all into 
a thin prefabbed element. And you know, here's kind of the spec sheet on it for anyone who's curious. Um, but the components being a, a CLT panel, um, and, and this is like a trenched out piece of CLT where we've inlaid uh, post-tensioning. Um, post-tensioning is where you, you cast concrete and you pull a cable, a steel cable, extremely hard, um, like 10,000 pounds or so. And um, what, we re what re it results in is a, a very strong, very slender 40-foot-long uh, panel. Um, so Craig didn't go into this. This is how we actually built it. So we, uh, you know, this, the, and, uh, you know, right now we're looking at like amateur SketchUp renderings, but we actually did build this and we learned a lot from the actual building. Um, but we, it comes into our factory upside down, trenches cut. We inlay a ton of screws. Um, uh, these are angled screws to, to develop the composite action between CLT and the eventual concrete. We also at this stage lay post-tensioning bands and a bunch of rebar into these. Uh, they're small, very kind of cute looking beams in the end. Um, cast all the concrete high early, uh, flip it over um, the next day essentially. Uh, hammer in a bunch of kerf plates and that's done. That's It's done in the factory, we pile it outside. Uh, once the concrete comes to strength, we post tension it. The panels actually curve upwards. Um, about 60 millimeters. It's pretty remarkable to see um, in person. And then we ship these to site and this will be, you know, installed as you would install the CLT panel, kind of side by side. We would come back on site later on and pour a monolithic concrete topping over the over it. Um, as a contractor, we wanted to make it easy as possible to install. So we designed it um, with that camber in place, which allows us to pour the concrete without reshoring underneath. So the camber comes out as you pour the concrete and it, it ends up in the final position cambered about 10 mils up. Um, and then long-term creep takes it down to zero. So that's the, uh, but no, no reshoring, which is a, a big drain on resources on site. And it's an expensive uh, piece of um, construction. So it's kind of the cross section, just the quick value proposition. You saw the renderings before, um, you know, we're removing a column line and a bunch of beams is the result of all this, uh, which, which is, you know, adds a lot of value to certain spaces like maybe this one. Um, and really what we were initially focusing on was the commercial sector. And due to like kind of how the industry has played out in the last couple of years, we have now uh, began approaching a lot of post-secondary institutions. You know, this is a, a long span product, great for uh, classrooms, um, institutions, things of that nature. So the aesthetics is a big driver. We leave it all exposed, um, you know, within the code limits. And um, we're not saying it's going to be faster. It's going to be the same as a steel building. We've kind of done a big crane pick analysis. It's about the same as a steel building, but you end up with an exposed finish. Whereas usually in a steel building, you have to like go back and hang, um, uh, you know, a drop ceiling or you spray fireproof over it. So maybe on the whole, it's like a slight edge, but not really something to write home about. Um, one of the interesting things, you know, when we get in, if we get into multi-story buildings, um, you save about a foot uh, per floor because this is such a slender panel. We've built a lot of steel buildings and a lot of concrete buildings with 40 foot spans. So these are real numbers. Um, the actual uh, numbers that you'd end up with on a 40 foot span of steel or concrete. And so it's maybe about 20 to 30 centimeters uh, more slender in the field of the building. Around the perimeter, you'd still have a perimeter beam that would kind of be equivalent. Um, but that's an interesting thing when you start getting to multi-story buildings, save a couple of feet on envelope and a two-story building, save a couple of feet on all your uh, elevators, things of that nature, maybe add up in the end. Uh, maybe it's not surprising that it's a premium cost product <laughs> at this stage. You know, we've we don't we haven't built the job yet. This is a research project after all. Um, it came out to you know, this is a total budget. So you know we uh, we priced it out in a couple ways here. But looking at total budget, we were about uh, seventeen dollars a square foot more than a, the, a conventional building with steel and concrete hybrid, like uh, the ones you see downtown here. Um, that's like not palatable in a lot of cases, right? And so we broke it out further. Um, you know, in this case, our insurance rates were quite bad. <laughs> and uh, so about half the difference in premium, 
about half the premium was due to the insurance in this case. Um, and we haven't, you know, this is research budgeting. This is not actual project budgeting. Um, but it's certainly a premium project, which is, again, why we're targeting post-secondary institutions that maybe have a bit of a different value proposition that they're trying to uh, achieve uh, than like a private sector developer. So this is where we're at today. And I think Craig showed you all this. We've gone through a lot of phases of tested desktop stuff, small scale testing. We're, we're now just at the, the cost, full scale testing is like starting this week. And um, it's really exciting. We're kind of in a position now to be able to snap projects and um, actually quote and design full projects. So we're, we're excited to talk about that. But just running through some of the small scale tests we did over the last couple of years. Um, some fire testing we did at NRC. Um, we should mention that a lot of, when we entered the real world, things started getting more expensive. And um, that's one of the barriers to uh, R&D and construction for sure. Uh, however, in the timber space, there's actually quite a good grant program through the federal government to match um, companies' investments. So El San put in a bunch of money, Dialog put in a bunch of money. We got all of it matched and multiplied uh, by National uh, NRCAN. Uh, so a lot of generous support from the federal government to, uh, uh, you know, they do that on uh, capital projects when you actually have a full building, but I also do that on much smaller scale things like a study project. So all in this, this whole project was under a million bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, they chipped in a big punch, a big uh, portion of that. So, you know, small scale testing, we learned a lot from small scale, which we've kind of baked into the full scale test. Uh, you can see uh, we fabricated this in a, um, in a Stony Creek in one of our, our warehouses. And uh, you can kind of see some of the detail here. Um, this is iteration one. There's a lot of steel in this thing. <laughs> and uh, we're through structural testing, we've realized that there's some serious optimization to be had. And this is one of the big challenges with construction is that, you know, a, a panel maybe costs like $20,000. It's hard to iterate on that too many times um, financially. Um, however, we have to in order to improve this design. So, you know, iteration two is going to have 30% less steel. We're going to change the composite action of it. Uh, we're going to change the thickness of the toppings, thickness of the panels. Um, it's all about like dialing it in, zoning it in. Um, which takes a time and, uh, and and certainly a lot of dedicated effort, uh, which is one of the unique features of like the team that I run at Elistan is like, it's a, it's, it's the job. It's not like a thing we're doing on the side. It's our job to do this, which is hard to come by in construction, uh, which is why a lot of like uh, construction innovation sometimes doesn't uh, get too much past like the white paper phase. Cause it's not like a funded part of a, a business model. So anyways, we built a, Built some of these big ones. You can kind of see the scale there. That's uh, my colleague Vince in the back. Um, post tensioning. I think this is an interesting photo of the actual camber that comes into the panel on the right hand side there. Um, after the post tensioning, you know, um, so we've been doing a lot of tours. Um, and then we've since sent the panels out to FP Innovation. So they made the long drive out to Vancouver and uh, where they'll stay in the uh, a loaded position for maybe a year and a half. And it's because, it, you know, ultimate strength of the, all these things is known. We know how strong CLT is. We know how strong post-tension concrete is. That's quite well understood. What's really not well understood is the long-term response of hybrid structures. And so um, it's really hard to get long-term response without doing testing for a long-term as well, it turns out. And so what we're really testing here is all those interfaces, all the screws to wood and the curve plates to concrete, what's gonna happen in a loaded condition in years? And how does that creep settle? We're not worried about the ultimate strength, we're worried about serviceability here um, and uh, you know deflections. So then we're gonna do that for about a year and a half. And then afterwards, this is a rendering because we haven't done this yet, is uh, we're gonna build this rig and just crush the panels for fun, um, just to see what happens. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. We're, we have a, a couple of thing, uh, irons in the fire with actual projects we're looking at. Um, I'm trying to start small. There's no sense in losing our shirt on the first job. Uh, so, you know, one story, two stories, three stories, that kind of order of magnitude. And uh, yeah, we're really just trying to spread the word because we think it's exciting. We want like other people to know about it. And, uh, you know, we're sort of writing little papers. If anyone wants to learn more, just reach out by all means. And we're happy to uh, 
chat about it, but we're just, uh, we're just really excited. This is one of the first times at LS Dawn, at least, that we've, uh, we've taken a concept that was like, you know, in a white paper and a bunch of renderings and just pushed through, through a lot of friction and made it a real thing. So this is now a, a product patented in five countries around the world. And, um, you know, we're, uh, excited to see kind of where it takes us. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Uh, so if anyone has a question, we can take maybe one or two before we break for lunch. Up in the top there. Yeah, go for it. Oh, cool. Um, uh, my question to you is uh, it's a, a little off scale of uh, the, the mass timber topic, but um, the kind of resonates with what you brought up. Uh, I know you guys do a lot, a lot of work here. Um, and I, my question to you and um, the other panelists that were uh, up front um, uh, a little while ago is that. You guys have any plan in place to um, store food direct to be master planning to kind of protect your assets uh, from say like uh, some of our infrastructures uh, that are potentially a minute to come with it, uh, like the gardener. So, uh, like a, pl a plan in place for Mel is done to protect like aging infrastructure assets. That's a good question. I'm definitely not the person to answer that uh, within Elliston. Yeah, I mean, the I don't think so, to be honest. I don't think we do. I think we, I mean, we we're involved in quite a bit of construction of the new infrastructure, and all of that involves, um, you know, a lot of the new infrastructure is coming out in a in a, um, a different. Uh, contract model than it was previously. Like we're doing a lot of P3 infrastructure now uh, where we even maintain it over the lifespan. And so I guess inherently in that we're designing into it a lifespan that we're willing to take the risk on. And now I'm speaking not about timber at all. Like we're doing no timber infrastructure whatsoever, but like a lot of the bridges and highways that we build, um, you know, we take on that maintenance piece. If, I mean, if you're interested in that, I'm, I can connect you to the right person in Elson, maybe. Uh, for me, it's just a uh, uh, really good place uh, to bring up the topic, so it just resonates with uh, the rest of the, the room. Yeah. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Everyone's hungry. <laughs> Mark, Patrick Crab here. Excellent presentation. Yeah. It's always great to we see met. you guys. Uh, yeah, we met before. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I would like for you to fill in a, a few more gaps here about your market adaptation plan for this panel. Yeah. Um, is this something that you plan to make available to you know other general contractors? Is it going to be kind of like a proprietary product business system on its own? Um, I think it has lots of potential and, um, you know, I'm sure companies like Bird would be willing to support it as well. Yeah, yeah great question, Patrick. Thank you for that. The, uh, yeah, we're open. We're open. It's, it's going to evolve over time. We, uh, like I mentioned, we're in like the dialing in phase of the design. So we, we have to iterate on this a little bit. Uh, and so the, the intention is we do a little bit of the first couple years in house where we take, um, uh, probably a job that Elliston is the contractor on, maybe a job that dialogues the architect on, but not necessarily. And we, um, we subcontract to ourselves and because we want to just control the manufacturing, the first go around and understand this product in depth. So that might happen for a, a couple projects. And then that'll also allow us to develop our processes to a point where we think we can actually allow others to use this product successfully. I don't think it would work well. We immediately set up a, um, like more of a competitive arrangement. So yeah, the, 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 the first step is going to be us doing it in house as a, a pretty much like a proprietary system. And then, um, to Elliston and dialogue. And then, uh, in the future stage two is, you know, 
that was, uh, we could be a manufacturer or others could be a manufacturer of our system. And we would just kind of arrange how that works. And then the phase three is licensing out just the technology, you know, it doesn't have to be in North America. Uh, I mentioned patented in five countries. So we're looking at people in Japan and China and things like that are just interested in um, this. We have no intention of manufacturing anywhere over there. And so that would just be more of a license deal. Um, yeah, happy to work with everyone just in time. One more question, if there's any more before we break. No, well, thanks, Mark, so much again. Thank you, thank you all. And now we're gonna break for lunch outside. Uh, feel free to, to grab some lunch and connect with different people as well. And uh, we'll be meeting back here at 1.15.